The following podcast is taken from a live broadcast on Inspire FM. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Book Club Show on Inspire 105.1 FM. My name is Imrana and today is the Tuesday the 24th of September and it is five past ten. I hope you enjoyed um, that Nasheed by Shah Mercy Like the Rain is Falling Down, which I think is quite apt this morning because I did the school run and... Um, literally my feet were soaking and that was despite the fact that you know um we were quite kitted out we had our umbrellas and and everything but I hadn't actually thought about feet and Wellington boots so um I would say the best way to describe how I was feeling is like a wet potato by the time I get home um but yeah so I had to um I have to buy myself actually a pair of Wellington boots because my trainers were actually at home right now and they're, they're drying hopefully and um Anyway, so today's uh, book club show, we are discussing the book A Fly Girl's Guide to University. This is being a woman of colour at Cambridge and other institutions of power and elitism. Um, And the reason that we're reading this book today is we actually have two of the authors joining us this evening in Luton at the Hat Factory. This is part of Dar Amna Book Club, which I also run. We're actually celebrating our fifth um, anniversary we've been running for five years and um which is absolutely amazing alhamdulillah um and it's just about really celebrating that journey tonight and hopefully uh, being able to discuss something really um i guess relevant at the moment because there's many um young people who'll be starting university um this month even this week and um but it's more about really unpicking what does that mean we we know it's almost like um as we're growing up there's this fixed trajectory that we have this idea that we are going to obviously study we'll go to school we will go to college and then we will go to university obviously that's not a journey that everybody is for everyone but for those of us who maybe do want to follow slightly academic route that is kind of something we just think okay it's going to happen and we don't really think about those experiences necessarily of getting to university and then once we're there how how does it make us feel what what is it that um shape the person that we end up becoming is kind of you know fully grown adults if that's the right way to um put it um so today will just be really an interesting kind of exploration of that journey um we will be talking to um an educator a bit um later on um who is um Alsa Harris in the second half of the show um but firstly just to introduce um really the book to you so yes it's called a fly girl's guide to university being a woman of color at cambridge and other institutions of power and elitism um and as usual i'll start with the blog um sorry the blurb at the back and it says tony morrison once said if there's a book you want to read but it hasn't been written yet then you must write it In 2016, four friends wrote the book they wished they'd had as an 18-year-old woman of colour going to study in the elite academic institution of Cambridge University. And what a book. Wonderful, fiery, radical and brave. It uses multiple voices and forms such as memoir, polemic, poetry, critical approaches to document their experiences as a woman of colour in an institution that they had discovered failed to validate or even acknowledge their heritage, their gender, their reality. As such, it is the book that many more that that many, many more than its four authors will want to read, a book that very much needed to be written. Um, so when I started um, reading this book, I think it was one of those things that straight away, it really, really did resonate um, with my own experiences, I guess, of the education system, especially um, at university and just generally as well, I think, being um, a person of colour in this country um, and growing up with all the different experiences that we have, um, especially if we are parents who who um, are basically immigrants here and what, you know, that, that actually means. So I'm just going to um, read the preface, I think, which will be really uh, a good introduction to really what 
um, the book is about. But actually, even before I do that, um, I know it's a really interesting title. So it's called A Fly Girl's Guide to University. And obviously, if you go and look up the Urban Dictionary, uh, fly tends to mean anything that pertains to kind of being cool and hip and, and something. That's that's if I've got my lingo correct. I'm not, unfortunately, a young person anymore. Um, but in this context, fly is actually an acronym, which uh, stands for f- uh, Freedom Loving You. Um, so hopefully, as I read out this um a preface it will give an an idea of what it is that you know or what how this actual book um came about so it starts off with a little um poem by anayura uh, wahid who's actually one of my favorites so it says i will hold this space for your return i will hold this space because every every one of your lives is our life this poem is searching for you 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 this poem will find you. And this is um, a, men- uh, a poem by Nayira Wahid, and it's called The Immutable Measure of Black Life. So the words of Nayira Wahid sit with me as I reflect on the process of writing and editing this book with three other women of colour. I'm grateful to know. There is no amount of pages that exist that could capture the experiences we have all had in our lives. No concoction of phrases that could adequately describe the feelings and emotions that walk with us daily in the spaces we enter, whether because we are welcomed in them or not. It is through this writing, however, that I have found a language to share in that honours the spaces we create when we inhabit institutions like Cambridge. Living within, yet beyond, those spaces with the audacity to refuse their questioning of our existence. Whilst our backs bear the burdens that the world lays upon them, they are also the strength upon which we stand, alone and together. The Oxbridge experience has a face and narrative attached to it. That face is often the main character in the story of white cisgender males that society has laid out a path to traditional positions of power. It is a narrative embedded in systems of oppression and serves as a proof point for the maintenance of all old boys clubs. These institutions are aesthetically beautiful, but surrounded by ugly walls of insulation, ivory towers that allow others to look in and maybe enter, but never to fully participate. But that is not a complete narrative. So that's basically how the preface starts. And I think I will probably just interject here because um, my family and I actually just recently um, took uh, a trip to Cambridge. Um, and the reason for that was because we wanted to go to see the new eco mosque that has been built, which, by the way, is absolutely beautiful and stunning. You you know, so if you haven't been, I highly, highly recommend going to visit the eco mosque um, in Cambridge. It's kind of one of those things where you understand that when we say what it does it mean to be spiritual and be connected to um the divine i think that is a space that definitely does it the design the architecture the um the, the you know the calligraphy um the inscriptures i mean there's everything that I, I think that when we want to be in a place which is going to uplift us spiritually um that is definitely a space so i would highly recommend um going to see the eco mosque um and obviously you know doing your prayers there and and, and meeting um the wonderful people that actually have kind of created that space um they do um tours um in the mornings i think there's two tours i think one's at 10 a.m and one at 11 a.m which you it's free but you just need to um register beforehand um so yeah so our trip to cambridge was um obviously it was really lovely because we went to the eco mosque but also it was my first time going to cambridge and this idea that um many of us when we think of oxford and cambridge we do think of the universities i know um it's something our parents' generation were always, I think, kind of um, uh, really kind of intrigued by the idea that, you know, there's Oxford University, there's Cambridge University. We know that the, one of the most pre- prestigious universities um, in the country, if not actually the world, because they're so well known. Um, I mean, I have relatives even in Pakistan who are like, you know, OK, if we ever come um, to the UK, we really want to go either, you know, to see um, well Oxford usually actually. <laughs> but um, but yes, yeah, so what is it about? About these institutions that really kind of has everyone enthralled almost and um wanting to yeah just literally go and visit these spaces and i thought it was really interesting because we did actually um after our 
after we, we'd been to um, uh, the masjid, we did then um, go to Cambridge University and they were having kind of something called uh, Open Cambridge Day where there were things, you know, um, arts and culture spaces that you could enter for free. Um, except actually, so we were like, yes, okay, we've got a freebie, we'll be able to go into uni- uh, the university. But actually, no, they, they, it was ticketed. Um, but yeah, and the whole space outside the university was just full of people and, you know, mainly tourists. Um, and which I, I guess we were also at the time um, in a way and just people sitting outside and I guess really admiring um, the building and just kind of soaking what soaking in what it actually means but it was really interesting for me because I'd already started reading um, this book that we're discussing today A Fly Girl's Guide to University um, and this has been written by Lola Olufemi, Odelia Young, Waithra Sabatindra and Sahima Manzur Khan so they are the four authors of this book A Fly Girl's Guide to university and because I'd already started reading this I suddenly felt so so different in that space um it really is making me think that you know we get so um we admire these spaces but actually are they really for us or were they ever um created with us and by us I mean um people of color you know children of immigrants or however it is that you might um identify yourself um you know BME and there's all these labels um and it was just one of those things that I know many of us who are parents, we perhaps we have, um, you know, ambition for our children, you know, or dreams for our children that they're able to go to Oxbridge um, and to uh, go to kind of these elite institutions where they um, will get, you know, ideally the best um, education that there is. Um, so I'm just going to carry on with the um, preface that I was um reading um so this preface is written um by um odelia um young um so she ca- continues to say um there are those of us who find ourselves for a multitude of reasons on the other side of those walls within the ivory towers our existence is acknowledged as progress but only as long as we play the role in the narrative that is written for us studious quiet and grateful without intent to rock the boat but we do exist We are here. There may not be many of us, but we are very much present. These institutions must be made aware of this, even if they don't expand their spaces for us. We do not seek equal representation to take part in systems of oppression, but rather the ability to freely create and become without fear of obliteration. In the summer of 2015, I began to reflect on my time at Cambridge as my studies came to an end. I was a graduate student who who had found herself once more in the midst of a world shrouded in whiteness and its power and privilege. When I spoke to people about Cambridge, they too believed the narrative of the white cisgender male who graduated atop the rest of the country, the world at his fingertips. When I shared stories of police harassment, marginalisation and erasure, people either did not know whether to believe them as singular events or they sympathised at a surface level. But I'm not the only one who has ever looked around in fear or frustration when the ivory walls closed in around them. And I'm not the only one who has made it to the other side without being completely crushed by those walls. Yet, I also recognise that survival often comes from making sacrifices of self and being granted certain privileges. Through all of this, there are those of us who have to tell ourselves that it's okay if we did today, if all we did today was survive. This was a story I wanted to share. At first, I planned to write the story with a black male friend from my master's program. I then thought I would write the story alone. As I began to write, however, I felt like something was missing. I was reminded a few weeks into my writing about Fly, the organisation for women of colour at Cambridge I had joined, and the blog in which these women had posted about the very topics I was penning to paper. I knew that without some of these voices added to my own, the telling would be incomplete. Even in this collection of four voices, the telling is incomplete, and there are voices we cannot and should not speak for. I hope that in uh, in the sharing of our truths, others will do the same for theirs. Collectively, we begin to form the narrative that is often pushed to the peripheries of institutions such as Cambridge. However, just as Bell Hooks wrote, it is in these margins, these peripheries, that we have found our power both individually and together. Um, so there's a little bit more um, to the preface, but I think that's kind of a good place to perhaps, you know, just explore actually what it is about this book that makes it so um, powerful, in my opinion. It really is the idea that um, going back to the blurb, that if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it by Toni Morrison. Um, that many of us, um, I think, 
we are sometimes in spaces it could be at work it could be at school it could be in any kind of um, environment that we're in that sometimes we don't see ourselves um, you know reflected you know even you know on tv or in the media now what do we do in these situations do we you know just sit and kind of complain the fact that you know, why am I not represented why my story is not there why do not why can't I read about myself or do we actually go you know and actually do something proactive where we start creating those platforms for ourselves I mean I think for me that's probably one of the reasons I ended um I mean, I was in teaching, so I was part of the education system. But why that I ended maybe, uh, you know, in the arts I and mean, creativity is something I was always interested in. But realizing that actually that was where I could start creating spaces um, for the stories that matter. So my recent... Um, project called echoes of the diaspora um it was basically giving a platform for you know um the voices of missing women um and the idea that you know we, we it's really time that we need we want to be able to tell our stories we don't want to continuously um just be spoken for and you know whether it's um, you know hijab or, or um you know gosh i don't know all the other stereotypes of jihadi brides or oppression all the negative um kind of connotations that that people um associate you know just with the identity of being muslim um and i think that's why this book is so so beautiful it's about four authors uh, four women of color coming together and just writing about their experiences and and literally you know publishing a book which um is has been published by verve poetry press which is a public ha publishing house in um birmingham actually um who are kind of um dedicated to um giving a platform again to to, to people of color and you know diverse uh, diverse books um, so I think, um, um, as the book mentioned, it is a mixture of um, essays, poems, uh, different prose pieces. And it's really nice um, to read, actually, because it breaks up um, the chunks. And it's really, um, I think, beneficial for anybody who's reading. So you can dip in, dip out. It doesn't necessarily have to be read um, in a particular order either. Um, and I think... The fact that there are young people at the moment, as we said, who will be starting university and us as parents or carers, what conversations are we having with them? I mean, when I started um, university, I was probably one of the first in my family to, to go to um, uni. And that obviously being because, you know, um, my parents had come to, from Pakistan to the country when they were younger um, and always having and wanting their children, obviously, to do well in education. Um, and... At the moment, I know there's all these um, things on social media about, you know, Freshers Week and come and do this and uh, come and talk to us. And I just remember on my Freshers Week at university just thinking, what on earth am I doing, right? Why, um, you know, I'm being encouraged to sign up to all these things. So I'm in a completely new space. Um, and it's with anything. You're in a new space. You need, I guess, time to settle. You need to time to find yourself, really. And um, I guess if there are any young people listening, just to say that, you know, don't, I think, worry and don't pressure yourself that as you're starting university that you need to um you know uh know everything already because you it's a new journey that you're starting and um i think the most important thing is just being comfortable you know in who you are and i think that question is really interesting one because as um you know women of color but also as um you know uh, muslims of Pakistani, Bangladeshi, um, Indian heritage, or, you know, and obviously we're, we're quite diverse in, in Luton, whatever heritage background that we're from. I think that is one of the starting points. Are we comfortable in our skin? Are we comfortable with who we are? Or do we have that confidence? Um, because once you start university, it is quite a different space from being at university, at being at college. You know, perhaps in a town like Luton, you know, it, it's possible that throughout... Uh, your education kind of uh, system that you've been constantly with people that you've known in terms of friends or, or family friends and cousins you know and but what is it that you know once we are out in the space and especially if you end up going to university out of town so if we're you know living in Luton you end up going to university uh, whether it's in London or, or a different city again you know what does that mean and how do we um, make sure that we're comfortable in the spaces um, and you know, whether it's our relationship then with our kind of lecturers and and this idea of just having that confidence, not only in the way we carry ourselves, but even in, I guess, the um, um, education itself. So depending on what degree that you've decided to do, um, just being able to have that 
confidence that you know you are deserving of that space you belong in that space um and if there is anybody listening who maybe has been um who has studied at cambridge or um or even oxford or any kind of maybe slightly elite um and I'm using the word elite in, in quotation marks because it's just referring um, to the book because obviously the uh, subtitle is Being a Woman of Colour at Cambridge and Other Institutions of Power and Elitism. Um, so one of the um, essays in the book is, but is called The Breaking and Making the breaking and the making becoming brown and this is by Sahema Manzur Khan um, and she begins by saying it was 8am on A-level results day when my offer to study history at the University of Cambridge was accepted almost 19 still in my pyjamas and very much in shock I could ca- hardly conceive at that time how monumental a change this would be for my life not just in all the ways it was supposed to be not just because it was Cambridge and not even just because it was university but more significantly because Cambridge was the first place place I began to think of myself as brown um so that is a really interesting um a start to um Sahima's essay on this idea of being uh, I guess basically racialized and first um experience of suddenly realizing that being in such a white space how you end up perceiving yourself in terms of your own um identity so we will be heading over the break um in a moment um so after the break I will talk a little bit more about um this essay by Sahima and we'll also be talking to Alsa Harris who is um uh, an educator and um, just getting really her um, opinions and experience of, of university life and, and um, just education um, as a whole so grab yourselves a cup of tea and I will see you in a few moments assalamu alaikum you're listening to an inspire fm podcast making available our popular programs from our daily broadcast on inspire fm <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the Book Club Show on Inspire 105.1 FM. It is Tuesday the 24th of September at 10.30 and my name is Imrana. Um, I hope you enjoyed um, the first um, half of the show. We are discussing today um, A Fly Girl's Guide to University, Being a Woman of Colour at Cambridge and Other, in- other Institutions of Power and Elitism uh, written by Lola Olufemi, Udelia Young, Waitra Sabitendra, Sahema Manzur Khan. So we're four authors um, of this book and if if you missed it at the start FLY which is F-L-Y is an acronym for Freedom Loving You which was a group um, um, basically put together at the University of Cambridge for women of colour to be able to, it started off as a blog just to write about their experiences and anything that really they were concerned about or wanted to write about and that's um, how it came into fruition which now is obviously um, this book and it's talking about the experiences of being a woman um, of colour at Cambridge and we were just talking um, before the break about the fact that obviously there'll be young people at the moment who are starting university who might potentially be going out of town, maybe they even um, going to um, Oxford or Cambridge or one of those um, universities and actually how is it you, you know that they might be feeling at the moment or even maybe many of us who've been to university what is it or how did our experiences shape who we are now and you know in, te- in terms of going in um, you know in terms of following our careers or um, even you know being parents you know what is it that those experiences as people of colour um, kind of um, the impact that it had on us and I think it's really important to to um, unpa- unpick these things and I was talking to um, somebody actually um, yesterday about their own um, experience of being at university and they've just recently um, completed their um, postgrad and uh, I'm just going to read out uh, what that she um, shared so it starts by saying my university experience was a weird one in undergraduate studies, I've moved so far away from home, so she'd grown up in Luton and moved to a small village near, not far from Cardiff. I'd find myself in the weeks to follow asking myself, what in the world have I done? I was terrified and alone. However, a divine intervention, if that's what you want to call it, came along and a few days before the Freshers' Fair, I had a dream that I was taking this speech in a mosque. Little did I know, back then, it was the Shahada. Come the day of Freshers' Fair, I found myself at the Islamic Society and took on all the resources I could get my hands on. It was such a magical first year of university. I felt so fulfilled knowing that I had this relationship with God and it didn't matter whether friends, in quotation marks, wanted to do some outing. I was happy with whatever decision I had made within myself. 
Then um, she goes on to say, my postgraduate experience was different though. I felt like a newbie to education despite being freshly graduated from my undergraduate degree and going right back into education at 25. I felt like everything was a huge competition for success and attention. Maybe I was oblivious to it going on, going into uni before at 19, but I certainly saw it then. In all fairness, it was very competitive and a highly demanding course, but it seemed like everyone wanted attention from lecturers. We were only a small group of 20, so I felt more shy and unable to hide away from my usual class sizes of 60 or 100, like an undergrad. So when I read this, and you know, thank you so much um, to Paris for, for sharing that. Um, when I read this, it really actually, um, I found it so interesting, the fact that actually firstly how different her experiences of undergraduate undergrad and postgrad were um but also what she was saying at the end that that how she was feeling kind of this um shyness from I guess firstly being in a in a small class but also for it to be so competitive and I think that is something that we um you know I do find that it is the case this competitiveness which doesn't necessarily always mean um you know something negative necessarily but this idea that why is it then um some of us feel kind of that shyness that is it really shyness is it that we're being um reserved or is it the fact that we are actually in a space that we are questioning you know our belonging or um are we feeling you know out of place for any reason i think that's why this book a fly girl's guide to university is so important because when we are in spaces such as cambridge or or Oxford, which are predominantly white spaces, as is referred to in the book, you know, what ha what happens to our confidence levels? And does that impact then the way we see ourselves um, in that space? And do we feel that actually we deserve that space? You know, do we be belong in that space? And I'm sure there's many of us that actually um, have that feeling that we've earned it. You know, we've, we've gone through the ed education system, we've got our results, we've done really, really well, we've put all that hard work in, you know, but it, it's, it, yeah, so it is one of those um, really interesting, um, I think, conversations um, to have. So we will be joined um, soon um, by um, Ailsa um, Harris, who's an educator, to talk a little bit about um, her experience um, also. And, um, so just before um, the break, we were, I was reading um, an essay by The Breaking, called The Breaking and the Making, Becoming Brian by Sahema Manzul Khan. And she was just um, mentioned that um, Cambridge was the first place where she felt that she suddenly found herself or began thinking of herself as being brown. Um, so I'm just going to carry on uh, reading um, a little bit. Um, about that so when people were confronted with me they didn't see the person I knew me to be what they saw were two things my hijab and my skin color I wouldn't say that every single person treated me as such but for the many who had clearly never interacted with people who were not white before or in brackets who weren't from private grammar schools all those who had gained their only knowledge of Islam and Muslim fr women from mainstream media the feeling that I had to prove my individuality and thus humanity to people was overwhelming I, it was overwhelming when I was simultaneously battling the fact that student normality was not my normality. Drinking, clubbing and hoping to get with anyone were not high or even on my agenda. Indeed, being a Muslim before Cambridge had often distanced me from normality, but the student stereotype was even further from what I wanted to do or be. So how could I prove my humanity when I fell outside the norm of who was human in that space? My abnormality made me other. Yeah, so it's kind of really powerful um, few statements um, that we've got here by um, um, Sahema. So, you know, it's it's a really wonderful essay actually to read. We're now joined by um, Alsa Harris, who's an educator, to talk a little bit about experiences of um, just the education system really and, and, and young people and how um, their experiences probably shape them um, as they go to university. So um, good morning, Alsa. Are you there? Morning, Imrana. How are you this morning? I'm fine, thank you. Fantastic. Can thank I just say one yes. thing? Yes. You know the 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 person who wrote that piece you were writing. I think she's extremely lucky mm. that she didn't feel other until she went to university. Right, that is so interesting, isn't it? So do you want to kind of maybe expand on that a little bit? So do you feel well, that many actually others would feel it sooner? Well, it's, I guess it depends on your school life. Mm, sure. You know, um, I can talk from personal experience as a teenager I was in a school where I was the only black person mm. so yes, you definitely exactly. feel other there yeah yeah absolutely yeah 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 <laughs> you know, and, you know, and so I think she's lucky mm. that she was 
mature in some respects yes. before she she felt that and she might have been better able to deal with it because of that. Mm. I think if it starts when you're younger, mm. um, I think it can be really undermining. Yes, yeah. No, I completely so agree. So hard as it was for her, yes. hard as it was for her, um, I think because she'd had that stability, mm, it might have made her more able to deal with it. Yeah. Although it might have been more of a shock as mm. well. Yes, exactly. Actually, you've just reminded me, you're right, because even my own experience of, of going to school, junior school, which was um, in London, I was, yeah, in a predominantly um, kind of white uh, you know, space and yeah, and just experiencing racism. And and now then when in my adult life, moving to Luton and then, you know, so yeah, I think you're right. It, it's kind of completely different experience, isn't it? If you've experienced something very early on, how you then deal with it. But yeah, definitely I could imagine the shock, uh, which, um, which actually I wonder, you know, it'd be really lovely to maybe hear hello. from some, hello, can you hear me? Okay. I'll, Okay, I think we've just um, lost Alsa, but hopefully we'll be able to um, get her back in a moment. But yeah, that was a really good point that um, Alsa made there that, you know, in terms of perhaps with um, Sahema saying that she felt the first time she'd been racialized or, you know, um, noticed that she was brown, so to speak, was once she'd got to Cambridge. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I went to, I experienced quite probably a lot of racism um but but you know we, we say r- racism, but even that in itself, actually the fact that it's um, it they, it's what we call I guess microaggressions that you can't and maybe even at that age really kind of articulate what you've experienced, but you know that there's been some sort of prejudice or you felt kind of othered, which is probably the perfect way of of describing it. But then yeah, for then to go into a space like university and and coming back to actually the message from from Paris as well, um, the the fact that she, her experience of the um, undergraduate and postgraduate was completely different. I think I kind of felt the same. So whereas um, my undergrad was at Queen Mary University and absolutely enjoyed it and made some wonderful friends who I'm still in touch with, um, to then going to... Um, studying for my PhD at the Institute of Education and yeah just feeling very very different and 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 feeling um obviously where Queen Mary is based at Mile End which is in East London and Institute of Education being in Russell Square in central London and again trying to occupy those um different experiences again for me were um was really interesting and coming back to us Hamer was saying this idea that there's a culture of um just going to the students union and drinking and me opting for that that you know I need now need to go pray um so these little kind of um, things and, you know, the impact that has on, on university life, I think is interesting. So I think we have um, Elsa back online. Elsa, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm so sorry we lost you. But, yeah, so you were saying, yeah, in terms of um, how yeah experiences are different if you've, um, depending on um, how you maybe had your school life. Um, so how do you think for yourself primarily, because if you'd gone earlier on, you know, in predominantly white school, then how did that progression, I guess, impact you by the time you got to university? Is that something you can kind of well, um, compare? Well, I, when I went to university, I was also one of only two black people in the in the department. Right, yeah. So. I studied history, and yes. then at that time, uh, not many black people from Britain mm. went to university. Right. Uh, right. There were a lot of overseas students, mm. but not many who were born in the United Kingdom. So, yeah. Yeah. again, you were kind of one of the few. Yeah. Um, and so, so that was different. But I think, for me, mm-hmm. um, I think... And I think for all young people, I think having that self-esteem mm. is critical. Yeah. Because I think if you know who you are, I think you mentioned that in one of the... Yes. When you were speaking earlier. If you mm. know who you are, mm. or you have a good idea of who you are, then it's easier to cope with these situations. Mm. I think if you don't know who you are, mm. then it's very difficult. Because yeah. there's just so much. As you say, when you first go to university, yes. they say there's freshers' week, there's mm. all societies, there's all kinds of things going on. Yeah. And if you don't have a good sense of yourself, yeah. you can easily go off track, mm. very easily. Mm-mm. You know, I mean, yeah. you talked about the drinking culture. Mm. I never, ever was part of that. Yes. It wasn't part of my mm. culture. Yeah. You know, it had nothing to do with religion, but I, yeah, I, sure. you know, I just never grew up amongst heavy drinkers yes. or 
So I never, I hardly ever went mm-hmm. into a pub. Yeah. You know, because I just, it's just not what I, what I did. Yeah. And, you know, there's plenty of other things to do. And it may seem like that's the popular thing. Yeah. But there are plenty of other things going on. Yeah. And there are plenty of people who feel exactly the way you do about it. Yeah. It's just finding them. Exactly. That is such a good point, actually, because you're right, because it just it's, it's the way how everything is portrayed, isn't it? And then as soon as you think mm. of university and students' union, you automatically, I mean, I do anyway. And that's how I felt before Sci Uni. And, um, but you're right. It really is about just searching that group that becomes your, you know, tribe, so to speak, that you just um, share and you kind of have maybe similar values. And um, and it makes that kind of transition and all, all that journey, I think, so much, so much easier, which is, I think, why the idea of this um, having um, the, the the fly kind of group at Cambridge must have been so empowering for for the women that were that were part of that group. Um, and. So what do you feel about, you know, at, at the moment in terms of um, university and this idea of, you know, Cambridge or Oxford? And, you know, did you have certain perceptions of those two institutions? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. I, I didn't even consider it. Right. Yeah. And there were two reasons. why. Well, a, I didn't think I was clever enough. Right. That's another story. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but B... Um, I, I, I did even then. I felt it was a very elite place, mm. and I didn't want to go there. I didn't yeah. want to be part of that, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. You know the way it was portrayed. It just sort of thought, I don't want to. I don't know. This yeah. is not me. I don't want yeah. to go there. Yeah. It wasn't even about education. It was just mm. about, you know, I don't want to be with those type of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, so you kind of excluded yourself anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I know people who did apply and didn't get in. Mm. And I was astonished. I mean, and they weren't black, they were white. Sure, yeah. And they were very clever. Mm. But they didn't get in. And I just thought maybe they didn't come from the right background back then. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Because obviously there's also this... um, conversation out around class and the fact that maybe if you've been to a grammar school as opposed to you know normal state school and you know so there are so many uh conversations about how to even i guess get into cambridge and i completely echo what you were saying because i don't i it was never ever on my radar <laughs> it was never good and it's similar just thinking i'm not i'm don't um you know i'm going to use the word intellectual because that's what i kind of associated um being able to go to Oxford, you had to be highly intellectual and you had to you had to be mm. a certain way and that was just not um how I would have ever, you know, labelled myself. And, and even, to be honest, I remember when I did my PTC at the Institute of Education and our first uh, kind of introduction to, to, you know, all a room full of, you know, um, the future generation of teachers being, you know, told you were the kind of a creme de la creme, right? And just already mm. thinking, oh, my God, like, what am I doing in this space, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, really? But, yeah, I mean, just the whole language of how you're spoken to, it's completely different. And, and I think actually it's for some people that must lead to a form of arrogance, definitely. And we, we can see that already when we look at our, um, some of our politicians without naming yeah. any. But, um, it's inbred. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I agree. They don't even know they're doing it. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing. Mm. It's just part of who they are and how yeah. they've grown up. And, mm. you know, it's just, it's in them. But it's and, also and you, you have to deal with that. Yeah, but this idea that obviously they have a sense of entitlement. But but the thing is, at the end of the day, and this is what um, the authors are saying in the Fly Girls Guide to University, that we have every right to belong and we have every right to be in those spaces. So how can we are kind of um, empower and embed that in our young people. The fact that, you know what, if you are going to study hard, why, you know, there's no reason for you to think you can't actually be at these spaces, but how do we do that? How do we get that message across, do you think? I think it's really difficult, but mm. I think, you know, as I said earlier, it's about self-confidence as well. Mm. And it's about talking about it. It's about, you yeah. know, when I was teaching, we used to take kids to Cambridge in year nine mm. to go and have a look around and see what it was all about and yeah. and meet uh, students of colour who 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 were there right. studying. Yeah. You know, who could who could tell them about, you know mm. that it was good and it was great and there were lots of opportunities. So that already you what you're doing is creating it's like, oh right, okay. Yeah. This is a place maybe I could come to. Mm, mm, Do you see mm, what I mean? Yes. Yeah, it's yeah, about yeah. exposure yes. early. Yeah. Because some of the people you mentioned, mm. like our politicians, they've been told from cradle, yes. you're going to Cambridge. Yes. 
Yeah, so yeah. it's inbred in them, you know, that mm. that's where they should be aiming. Yeah. And so, in a way, we need to have those conversations with our children mm. and our grandchildren and say to them, you know, as good as anybody else, mm. no university is off, off limits to yes. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, mm. you go for it. Yeah, and, exactly. And I always say, you know, I grew up with a saying, it's a common saying, nothing ventured, nothing gained, mm. right? Yes, yeah, sure. If you don't apply, mm. then you're not going to get in. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, as exactly. simple as that. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have to apply. You have to put yourself out there. You have to take risks. Mm. To be successful in life, you have to take risks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and that's the same with education. You mm. know, Mm-mm. you know, I know that I didn't do it because I, I didn't think. Yeah. You know, I mean, I had trouble even just getting people to think I was good enough to go to university. Never mind go right. to Cambridge. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, that was kind of off limits mm. in a way. And also, I think another barrier was, is that Cambridge applications have to be in earlier than others. Right, okay. Oxford and Cambridge, point. they closed mm. their applications earlier. Mm. So you really so if you don't know about know. that, yeah, you know. Exactly. That can feel a bit intimidating. Well, why are they different from the rest? Exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is, it's all these, yeah, I mean, they, they, I mean, I, I use the word little, but, but not in, you know, in, in a way that actually when you are in that space where you need to be more confident than maybe... Um, you usually would yeah and it's like what you said about embedding it from a really um early age and i think that that is definitely important and because even i think you know on twitter just yesterday was it the day before you know those private schools was trending because obviously labor um again obviously there's no political affiliation but they were um suggesting um you know a, a few things around um, the education system and then some people actually def- you know obviously the two camps the either ones are defending the idea of private schools and the others you know not so um but again i was just remember thinking god i can't believe this is trending <laughs> i was just thinking of all the things going on in the world we're really still having this discussion and then this idea then of course of, of course of a of equality and representation and there's an essay in the book so fly girls guide to university where sahema talks about you know the burden representation i think even lola um alludes to it as well and um it's just it's true because actually though you might break that barrier and get into these institutions you then become um obviously minority in a minority almost and then you've got Mm -hmm. this burden representation so how do we then as people of color deal with that i I I know about that too yeah (laughs) So yeah, that's you know. been my experience of the education system. Even as a, when I went, to, when I was a lecturer at a mm-hmm. at college, yes, you know, and that again, I think there were like two people who were black when I went there. Yes, and you know, any time anything was required, they'd wheel me out. Was, yeah. Oh, well, we could ask Elsa about this. Yeah. And I always have to process my response by saying, look, I'm just one black person. Yeah. I do not re- represent all black people. Exactly. This yeah. is my opinion. Yeah. You know, so, so it is a burden. And yeah. when I was at school, I was very conscious that a lot of those people had never met a black person before. Yeah, yeah. And I felt that how I was mm. would be their image of what black people were. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I was very, very, very conscious of that. And yeah. everything I did mm. was really done in a way in that context. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So that, that is a burden. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. I mm. think um, I think you still have to be who you are. Mm. Yeah, of course. And yeah. I think you have to take the view mm. that it is not your job. Yeah. To, to represent mm. your your racial group, your mm. subject, your you know, you are you. Yeah. And if people want to take you as the example, mm. um, fine. Yeah. But if they get a misrepresentation as a result, mm. that is their problem, mm. not yours. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I completely agree with that. And, you know, and, and again, I think this is what I found so wonderful about the book. And if I found it quite, um, uh, how to say, kind of uh, not uplifting isn't the right word, because actually it was quite heavy in some places. But being, again, the idea that there was a book that I could read and think, oh, that's exactly how I felt. Or, oh, my gosh, this is exactly um the experience I had and just being able to read about yourself from from somebody else it, again it creates I guess that that um kind of group where you kind of do feel I guess uh, you know empowered and you know so thank you obviously to, to um 
Lola, Adelia, Waythra and, and Sahema for, for the, the book itself. And definitely it's it's something else we'll be um, discussing it today with um, the authors who are going to be joining us at the Hat Factory this evening um, at 7.30. And we'll be having an author event, which is part of Dharma Book Club, because we're celebrating our um, five years. So it's, um, you know, something really wonderful and positive to be able to um, do and talk about and just being able to invite them to Luton. Um so then, um, Alsa, what do you feel in terms of um, the spaces, university spaces? Because what you were saying is if we can um, start at a young age and we're exposing young people. Mm -hmm. But is that enough? Is it enough to say, oh, you know what? You can also do it. Because do you think... Cause what no, this, no, no, I think, yeah. I think you have to have the experience, A, of going to these places. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think schools perhaps need to have better representation mm. so that, you know, like in the classroom, you yeah. have people mm -hmm. of colour who can share their experiences. Just yeah. in past tense, it doesn't become a, oh, this is a big event and, yeah. you know, whatever. You know, I used to tell, when I was teaching, I used to tell kids about my life. Yeah. Not, 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 not very personal stuff, yeah, but obviously sure. experiences mm. that I thought would make it real. Yeah. For them. Yeah, sure. You know, and occasionally you can have big events where you invite people to come mm -hmm. that they can relate to, yeah. to talk about, you know, why, you know, having an education is a good thing. I mean, it's not mm. the only way to progress in life. Mm. And let's not forget that. Yeah. But if you are going to go to university, you know, or mm. you're thinking about it, it's not beyond your reach. You know, you have every right to. Yes to want to go yeah. if that's what you feel is right for you yes. and you have every right to feel comfortable when you get there. Mm. Yeah, exactly. No, absolutely. No, no, that's, and it's important, I guess, to get that message across. And I know obviously because we're reading um, about, you know, the guy to university, but, uh, you know, in the same, um, I guess, same breath to just say that even those uh, people who maybe don't want to go to university either, but, you know, in any space that they want to follow, any journey they want, that, you know, they're able um, to do that, which is so important. But we're just heading over to, uh, well, um, to the end of the show. So thank you so much, Elsa, for your time and your contributions. That was really um, lovely speaking to you. So thank you so much. Um, okay, and And so um, it's just, I think, been the most important thing really that I like people to take away is that we do belong in spaces and we shouldn't even this idea of feeling grateful is not actually necessary because if we earn our space somewhere we should be able to own that and just be really proud um and um so if you are um obviously um maybe available this evening we have um, um Sahema and Wais for joining us this evening to talk about Fly Girls Guide to University at the Hat Factory and um I will be back in a couple of weeks with um a different book so I hope you will join me again have a lovely week in the meantime assalamu alaikum thank you for listening to our podcast why not tune in to our live stream at inspirefm.org and follow and subscribe to our social media platforms at InspireFM Luton.